Unit 1. The Structure of Geometry. Part B. The Scope of Our Geometry. Lesson 1. Undefined Terms. Objective. To explore various geometries in order to determine the focus of our study. Now that we have spent some time exploring geometry as a structured mathematical system with the same five parts of speech we have encountered before, it is time to make sure that we agree on which geometry we are going to study. Which geometry? You're right, that does sound strange, but the fact is there are numerous geometries to be considered. What I mean is we have accepted certain terms without definition. And if a term is not defined, it really could mean anything. Remember our discussion of circularity when we tried to define a point? So let's dig a little deeper. And to keep it simple, we will restrict our discussion to the description of points and lines. To begin, let's describe a point as a dot. In some situations, that makes a lot of sense. For example, Images on television screens, computer monitors, calculators, and even scoreboards are made up of arrangements of tiny dots called pixels. These pixels are arranged in a rectangular array of rows and columns called a matrix and are so numerous and so close together that what you see appears connected. Of course, the tinier the dots and the more numerous they are, the clearer the image will be. We can then say that we have better resolution. I'm sure you've heard that term before. Some of you may have used dot matrix printers before. Now you should have a better idea of how they work. Small pins making small ink dots arranged on a piece of paper to make you see a specific image. Now, since we know that lines are made up of points, in this case, a line must be a set of points, but there will be a space between their centers. Again, if we use smaller dots, we can make cleaner lines with less space, but they are still just dots. So in this geometry, I can draw two lines which cross each other, but have no points in common. What do you mean not fair? Both of these lines are made up of specific points and they cross each other. They just do not have any point of intersection. When we think of points and lines this way, we are entering the study of discrete geometry. That word comes from the Latin word discretus, which means separate. It really means what it says, doesn't it? Every point is a separate point, and every line is made up of separate points. Here's an example of another type of geometry. Suppose we describe a point as an exact location. We may represent it with a dot, but we are really focusing on the idealization of the dot with no side. The dot is only a picture of the point. Well then, how would you describe a line? That's right, it is a set of points, but we need to be a little more specific. It is a set of points extending in both directions, containing the shortest path between any two points on it. That means this is not allowed. In other words, it has to be straight. You have dealt with this description before. Do you remember number lines? They were actually sets of exact locations, each of which had a number assigned to it. This allowed us to find the distance between any two points by using arithmetic. We simply found the difference between the two coordinates and took the absolute value of that result. Remember? Describing points and lines in this way takes us into the study of synthetic geometry. That word makes some sense too when you realize that it came from the Greek word synthetos, which means put together. We are putting the discrete or separate elements together to make continuous figures. 
And what about this description? A point is an ordered pair of numbers. Sound familiar? It should. This is the description you used when you showed the solution set of a first degree relation with two variables. Remember, you built a Cartesian plane named after the French mathematician René Descartes, and you plotted points on it to represent solutions. In fact, that leads us to the description of a line in this geometry. A line is the set of ordered pairs x, y such that ax plus by is equal to c, where a, b, and c are integers and a and b are not both zero. You may remember the more familiar form y equals mx plus b called the slope-intercept form. You didn't realize you were studying geometry back then, did you? This is what we call coordinate geometry, or more properly, plane coordinate geometry. Very simply, it is the geometry of points as ordered pairs in a plane. This is a very helpful approach when studying parabolic or exponential functions, which are shown as curves in the coordinate plane. Remember them? Our final example is a rather peculiar one. It came about as the result of an investigation called the Konigsberg Bridge Problem. There is an actual city in Russia which used to be called Konigsberg. It is now called Kaliningrad. Anyway, through this city flows the Pergola River. Here's a simplified map of the area. There are two islands in this river and seven bridges connect the islands to each other and to the shores. It was common on Sunday for people to take walks over the bridges. These walks and bridges led to a question which developed into the Konigsberg Bridge Problem. The problem was to find a way to walk across the seven bridges of Konigsberg so that each bridge is crossed exactly once. A great mathematician, Leonard Euler, became very interested in this problem and because of it, he developed the basics of a new geometry. Now stay with me as we find out how he described points and lines. First, he named the islands, shores, and bridges. Does that look familiar? He then redrew the map with the islands A and D very small and with longer bridges. That doesn't really change the problem, does it? Then he realized that the shores, B and C, could also be very small. Again, not changing the problem. I'm sure you're ahead of me by now, aren't you? Finally, Mr. Euler took the big step. He thought of the land areas, A, B, C, and D, as points, and the bridges, A through G, as lines, in this case, arcs, connecting them. The result is a network of points and arcs, and as you can see in this network, there may be more than one arc connecting two points. This geometry is called network geometry, more commonly called graph theory, and in it, a point is described as a node of a network. A line is described as an arc connecting either two nodes or one node to itself. So you can actually draw two or more lines through the same two points. Strange, huh? Oh, you want to know the answer to the problem? Well, you'll have to help me analyze it. First, notice that when a path goes through a node, it uses two arcs, one to the node and one away from it. So what happens at a node connected with three arcs, called an odd node? That's right. You can go through the node with two of the arcs, but you can only leave or arrive using the other arc. So that node must be the starting point or the finishing point. Well, that means you can only have two odd nodes in a solvable network problem, one to start with and one to end with. The answer to the Konigsberg bridge problem is no. All four of the nodes are odd nodes. You know, this type of problem may seem rather silly, but it has become very important in real life situations. For example, setting up bus routes, security agent patrols, and airline flight routes 
requires a good understanding of network geometry. Okay, it's time to decide. Which geometry are we going to study? Oh, I'm sure you're on the edge of your seat, right? Right. Well, we are going to base our study on Euclidean geometry, named after the Greek mathematician Euclid. Euclidean geometry applies both to synthetic geometry and coordinate geometry, and is probably the most applicable to our everyday life and the way we view and measure things. Another way of saying this is that we are going to study plane geometry. In the work text, you're going to get a little more experience in each of the geometries we introduced in this lesson, but that is only for your general information and reference. So enjoy thinking and speculating about the exercises as puzzles to be solved.